The beginning of this piece, I get goosebumps every time it starts. So we start the opening of this, and within about the first two measures, with how Bach is moving those key centers around and, and the turbulence and the stirring, it almost feels like someone is stirring a vat uh, and getting ready to tell you this great story. He is setting us up for about the most powerful entrance of any of his works. So he goes on for all of it. 19 measures of this kind of grinding 16th note strong bass pulse almost a heartbeat pulse to have the choir come in at fortissimo of singing lord lord thou art master so how does one find the relevance of what he what was performed almost 300 years ago to today and the answer is human nature hasn't changed. The story hasn't changed. And what we have forgotten when we listen to the music of Bach and we think about his music is we forget what an incredible dramatist he was. The passions as a uh, musical form go back to the medieval miracle and mystery plays which were intended to be presented to the people because the people were not literate and as a way of teaching them the biblical stories. Um, and gradually that evolved into a musical form instead of just a dramatic form. But now, and with the Bach Passions, they are probably the epitome of the form. Oh, well, oh, well, oh, well. How he tells you a story and helps you see it visually and creates the drama, all within the confines, remember, of what he had to work with compositionally, what was accepted compositional practice, what he knew, what his parishioners knew. And while he wanted to certainly take them along with him and educate them, he also was well aware that if he went too far, he couldn't get their attention and he would not be able to perform it again. So we don't want to do When you're looking at a passion, you almost have to think of it like a cast, somewhat in like a, a dramatic presentation. So the evangelist serves as kind of a narrator. He ties the story together. He, he weaves the bobs and it's, it's, it's frankly uh, acrobatic singing. Uh, it's fascinating to me and it takes a very special voice and a special voice who can interpret this well. Then you have to have your regular solos, four full solos, who also enlighten the story and interact with the choir sometimes and sometimes they have what is referred to as commenting or uh, courses that tell, help tell the story or enlighten the story. Of course you have to have the chorus that it plays a multiple uh, roles and then you have a person who does Peter and Pilate and little roles like the maid and the servant and then of course you have Jesus and Jesus when he sings in the recitatives always sounds unhurried always humble and always confident whenever Christ sings the organ which provides a very even temper, tempered sound and a very warm sound underneath him always accompanies Christ Pilate is an interesting character. He's, he's probably, although he doesn't have a huge part, he's probably one of the most interesting characters in the Passion. In the Roman Empire, there was a particular title that Caesar gave to his special people that he really liked, and it was called Friend of Caesar. And this was, it wasn't given out very often, but when it was, that meant that you really had a close tie with the emperor, and he thought a lot of you and he also gave you a lot of money when he gave you that title. Now Pilate really wanted to be a friend of Caesar. He really wanted to be, and everybody knew this because they knew pretty much what Pilate was. And so the Jewish hierarchy found that button of Pilate's and they say to him in this chorus, uh, if you let this man go, you aren't going to be a friend of Caesar because this man says he's a king and that nobody who says he's a king can be a, 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 a person who we would want in the empire. So if you let him go, then that's going to mean that Caesar is not going to make you his friend. When I talk about Bach as being the Shakespeare of music, 
the, the fact that his characters are like Shakespeare's people we can identify today is a very important point. Uh, for instance, I've mentioned Pilate. Uh, the people in the mobs are, you can find those same people today in, in mob situations. We see mob situations all the time and they act the same way. Uh, the soldiers back then are, they, they don't have guns, they have spears and, and, and swords, but they're just like, they behave just like soldiers today would in that kind of situation. They're, they're, they're doing their job, they've got a, a government that they have to serve, and they're doing their job as best they can in what proves to be a pretty difficult situation for them. <laughs> There are some fabulous um, examples of text painting in this work. As a matter of fact, as you go through, you almost get stuck um, every other page on, oh my gosh, look at what he's doing here. Some of my very favorites are, and one in particular, is how he paints the story of the soldiers dividing up his clothes on the cross, when it's on the cross, and they're doing it through rolling dice. And how he does that musically is is brilliant. So you have each part entering polyphonically with bum 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 very rhythmic and you all can hear the dice. Ba -da 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 you hear the dice rolling and then you also hear the mockery of the soldiers. And what I find fascinating is he he's telling this this horrific story and this very profound story and then leaps right back into daily life. Well, here's the soldiers rolling the dice over this, this poor man's clothes. Some other little bits of, of cool symbolism. The story when, when uh, Peter betrayed Christ and that Christ predicted that the third time that he betrayed him, they would hear the, the uh, crowing of the rooster. And at the, in the story in the Passion, after the third time, you hear a little thing from the cello, the continual cello that imitates the rooster crowing. And then it says that Peter went off and wept bitterly. And as he wept bitterly, it just keep the pitch keeps going down and it keeps going going down by by uh, chromaticism. It sounds very desolate and it ends with just a one solid low F sharp in the cello which makes it very, very alone, very stark. Bach had a very interesting way of, of separating kind of the heavenly por portion and the very earthly portion. And throughout, you see him being very earthy by how the soldiers interact, by how the mob scene is vicious at times and sometimes they're rather indifferent. Uh, sometimes it's the high priest saying, we have a sacred law, we can't kill him, but Pilate, you can. And so deferring the, the, the anger and, and getting someone else to do their dirty work. Well, one chorus and, and aria in particular is very telling. And in my study with Alfred Mann, I asked him, why do you think that Bach would create a triple feel in the accompaniment? So it's actually in a 4-4, but with a triplet, so you have a Bum, 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 underneath it. But the chorus is in straight uh, duple meter, so it's, it's, it's really a three against two feel. Dr. Mon's conjecture was because the triplets referring to the Trinity and the duple being still on earth, it was the struggle between heaven and earth of where Christ was in that struggle between heaven and earth. So the soloist and the orchestra are playing in the triple meter. And the chorus is singing in a straight chorale duple meter, which creates this amazing effect of the pull and tug of the rhythms or the pull and tug where Christ is between heaven and earth as he dies. Did Bach really intend all this symbolism? And the answer, when I ask Alfred Mann that, he didn't give me a straight answer. Typical of him in, in the scholarly approach, it was not yes or no, it was all I know is Bach did not write any unintentional notes. 
one of the reasons why this Bach festival does the, the passions in English. Well, over the decades, we've tried a few of them in German, and frankly, historically, that's probably more accurate. Scholarly, more people consider it more scholarly to do it in, in German, and frankly, in many ways, it's easier because the text lines up easier. But then the audience misses out on the story, and frankly, we lose that absolute connection to the relevance of today by putting it in a language where people are having to constantly refer to their notes. So we now proudly say we do them in English and we give you the story why and we think it makes it a very relevant storytelling for today. Do you hear how beautiful it is when you sing softly? <laughs>